Okay, so I'll leave this to you to prove. And the rest we can go to this. Anything else here? Yeah. Okay. So let's talk about Bayes' theorem. This is our first um, data mining algorithm, which relies very much on probability, and that's why we, although there are some other uh, <coughs> algorithms that also rely on probability, so we have some reason to have reviewed probability. Okay, so we want to talk about an algorithm in data mining called Naive Bayes. So quickly, let's review what we've said, uh, a little bit of what we've said so far. So we have to, you have to keep in mind this basic definition. Okay, so please keep this in mind. What is this? The probability of A given B is equal to what? Probability of A intersect B divided by the probability of B, right? Please, that should be like, you know, we don't have to keep um, thinking about it too, too hard. Okay, so please remember that. That is just the definition. And then as a review, uh, suppose we have two boxes. Here's box one, here's box two. They both have uh, blue and yellow dot, uh, balls. Uh, they have different numbers. Uh, box one is green and has four blue balls and eight yellow. And box two is purple and has two blue balls and ten yellow balls. Okay? Suppose we select a, a box at random, and then select a ball at random. So the same kind of thing that we were talking about just a few minutes ago. Then we can ask questions like the following. Simple probability question might be, what is the probability of getting a blue ball given that we selected box one? So what's the answer to that? So you can see box one, what's the probability that you get a blue ball given that you selected box one. Four out of, uh, I guess it's 12, right? Is, that, is there 12? One, two, three, four, five, six, yeah, I think so. Okay, four out of 12. Okay, so that's, uh, everyone agree? Okay, <clears throat> this can be written as what? How can we write this? What? Well, no, I mean the question. How can we write the question? of blue given box one, right? Probability of blue given box one. Does everyone agree? So the probability of a blue ball given that we got box one, right? Everyone agree? Okay, a more confusing question, however, might be, what is the probability that we selected box one given that the ball is blue? So we look at it, we said, okay, it's a blue ball. So what's the probability that it came from box one? I don't know how many people can think about that, but it sounds confusing. Right? Okay. How do we write the second question? So if this one was blue given box one, the other one is what? Box one given blue. Right? That is, it came from box one, um, I would, we want to know the probability that it came from box one given that the ball is blue. So it's written this way, right? Given that it's blue. This question is difficult to, to think about because the order of the events is mixed up. First, what we actually did was we selected the box and then we selected the ball but here we're saying, suppose we have a blue ball, what's the probability that it came from box one? So the order of the events is mixed up. So that ordering can make it confusing. So this one is not confusing, right? Given that it came from box one. But this is confusing, given that it's a blue ball. Right? So Bayes' theorem, not... That's different than naive Bayes. It's the same Bayes, but it's not the same 
Bayes' theorem will allow us to reverse the order if we want. So it will give us the option to reverse the order. So if you encounter this one, you can uh, reverse it and have to do problems like this instead, which are possibly more natural. Okay, so this is Bayes' theorem. Uh, this is the statement of Bayes' theorem. So it says the probability of A given B is equal to the probability of B given A times the probability of A divided by the probability of B. Now we're going to prove this, but this is the statement of it, and you can see that, <coughs> notice that on the left side we have A given B, but on the right side we have B given A. Of course, <coughs> there's more on the right side than on the left, but the conditional part is reversed, and that's what we wanted. Okay? <coughs> Okay, so let's prove it. Okay, so here's like our sample space, or U. Okay, we can call it the universal set, <coughs> or in probability, we usually, it's usually the sample space. And we have an event A over here on the left. Okay, and we can see that event A is everything here over to here. Okay, and so if this is event A, we say where is A bar, where is the complement of A, and obviously it's over here. <clears throat> and then we have some other event B, which is just sitting in our sample space, and it's probably going to intersect with A and with A bar. Doesn't, you know, and if we want to be general, we're going to say that it intersects with both. Okay? And so we can ask, um, where, is the intersection, uh, uh, where is the intersection of B with A? And of course that's over here. And we can say, where is the intersection of B with A bar? And of course, that's over here. Right? Are we in agree? And of course, B, the whole B, is equal to the union of what? A intersect B and A bar intersect B, right? B can be expressed as the union of those two pieces, right? And one more thing to notice about these two pieces. First of all, they, they, make, they cover B, right? <clears throat> and one other thing is that they're disjoint. Disjoint means they have nothing, their intersection is empty, they have nothing in common, right? Okay, and remember that that, that was in a kind of an important thing in our last lecture. If you remember, when things were disjoint, we could do something. So we'll, we'll be doing that something here because we can <clears throat> so anyway, B is equal to what? It's the union of the left side and the right side here, right? Okay. So if B is equal, if B is equal to the union of those two pieces, then the probability of B is equal to the probability of that whole thing, right? So the probability of B is equal to the probability of the whole thing. Right? Does everyone agree? Okay. However, we just said <coughs> that this piece is disjoint from this piece. And we had, we recall that one of our rules of probability from last week was that if A and B have nothing in common, if they're disjoint, if they're mutually exclusive. Oh, by the way, sometimes I'll, here I said, sometimes I will write A comma B instead of A intersect B. And that's very common in books to do that. So part of the reason, the real reason I did it was because I didn't want to have to type the intersection sign. But another good reason to do it is because you often see it that way in books. Okay? So instead of writing A intersect B, they sometimes write A comma B. So, um, in, so what does this mean here? The probability of what? A comma B means what? The probability of A intersect B. And if you recall from last week, we said, recall that one of our rules of probability was that if A and B have nothing in common, that is, if they're mutually exclusive or disjoint, then the probability of A intersect B is equal to what? The, we, you can just do that, right? Makes it really easy. Okay? But we just said that this and this are disjoint. Right? Therefore, the probability of their union can be written as what? The probability of the first one plus the probability of the second one, right? Everyone agree? So, in other words, it can be written this can be written like this, the probability of the first one plus the probability of the second one. Does everyone agree with that? So this is going to be important, so commit this to memory, although I'll show it to you 
on the screen as well. But, um, okay, so this is true. So that shouldn't be there. Uh, I said this already. We already saw this picture. We already said this, right? This we already said. We just finished with that. Now we want to see how Bayes' theorem is derived. So we have some, some basic stuff that we've just shown, like this. Okay, and we want to see how Bayes' theorem is derived and how it allows us to switch the order of A and B. So what's this again? This is just the definition of conditional probability, right? I said to, to, to remember this, we're going to use it, and here it is, okay? This is just the definition. Now I can bring this over to here, right? So that I get the probability of A intersect B is equal to this, right? Everyone agree? Okay, so this line from here to here we've shown, but of course this, this going from here to here is nothing, right? If you take A intersect B, that's the same thing as B intersect A, right? So you can do it, you can say this is equal to this, right? Does everyone agree? This one is equal to this one. Now I can bring this uh, over, just put right equals here, and of course I can just bring that over to the other side, right? So let's do that. So what I want to show you now, what I want to show in the next screen is going to be this. The probability of A intersect B equals the probability of B intersect A equals this. Okay, nothing there, right? That's what I wrote here. God, this is messed up. Sorry. Didn't work out very well. Uh, anyway, so here's what we have. We had that before. Okay, now, so we have this. And where where's this come from, this part here? This is just the definition of conditional probability. The screen didn't work out very well. This, the transition, something happened. Anyway, so now, how do I get this? The probability of A given B is equal to all this. Where does this come from? So A intersect B, I just showed, was equal to this, right? So I can take A intersect B and, and put this there instead, right? So that's what I did here, right? Everyone see it? Okay. And then, what else? Instead of probability of B, I already said the probability of B is what? This piece here. Right? So I just put that instead of B, I put this here. Okay? Everyone follow that so far? And one last step, and that is the bottom. Uh, the, I changed this one and this one. <coughs> Where does this? Uh, what can I do? What can I do with this? This a intersect b is what? Probability of b slash a times the probability of a, right? So that's here, and then this one is a bar intersect b. So instead of a, I have a bar. So instead of putting A, I put A bar. Instead of putting A, I put A bar. Okay? Anyway, I'll give you this, uh, this, uh, these slides, but we didn't basically, it's just the algebra here, moving things around. But we achieved what we wanted. What do I mean by that? What was, remember we talked about something being hard and something being easy, and we wanted to be able to switch the order. And what did we do here? Here I have A given B. On this side I don't have A given B, so I have B given A or B given A bar. Okay? And that's what we wanted. This is called Bayes' theorem. Okay? Okay, now a more general version of Bayes' theorem. Here's the universal set. Now I've broken up U into how many sets? Four. What are they called? A1, A2, A3, A4. Before, in the last example, I broke up U into what? How many sets? Two. What were they? A and A complement, or A bar, right? But here I'm being a little more general. Suppose we have a set U, usually called the universal set, and we have a collection of other sets A sub I. 
this case we have a1, a2, a3, a4, but it could be any number of sets. We will say that the sets a sub i partition the set u. So what is this going to mean, partition the set u? Any guesses before we get there? What? Divide it, and more than that? Or divide it mean, means what? How about this? Would this, do you think we might say this? Suppose we had this. Here's one set A, and here's another set, or here's one A1, here's A2, here's A3, and here's A4. So A3 is here, and here's A2. Do you think I'm going to call that part A1, A2, A3, A4, partition it? No, I'm not going to. What do I mean by partition it? It has to cover the whole thing. These cover the whole thing, but they have to cover the whole thing, and one more thing is what? Without overlapping, without intersecting. Okay? That's what we mean by the sets a sub i partition the set u. Okay? So what is it? The union of all the ai's equals u. And one more thing is what? None of the ai's intersect each other. Okay? That's called a partition of u. So this is a partition of u. Now suppose we have another set B, which is a subset of U, like that. Now what are we going to do? What did we do before? We said B equals, back here, well, can I just get rid of this? Uh, up here, what did we do? Well, even before that, too. Here. What did we do? We said B equals what? This piece, union this piece, right? So what are we going to do now? B equals? B intersect A1, union. B intersect A2, union. B intersect A2, and so on, right? Okay, so we're going to do B equals that, right? B intersect A1, union this, union this, union this, right? This. And what's special about these four sets? They are disjoint, right? Therefore what? The probability of B is equal to the probability of the whole thing, but the probability of the whole thing can be split up into plus, plus, plus. Right? So B equals that. And what? Then the probability of B is, we can write pluses, right? So what that's going to do is going to give us a general form of the um, Bayes rule. Okay, so uh, we can prove it basically in the same way that we just proved the case where we just divided it into two sets, but now we're dividing it into uh, more sets. Okay. Uh, by the way, in this notation in Wik from Wikipedia, I don't know if you can see this, but this is a kind of a line, and it goes down like that. That means that's another way of saying um, the complement of A. Okay, so Wikipedia is using that there. And this also is just copied from Wikipedia. So I did it here, but maybe, well, let's just quickly try and do it. So here's uh, the picture. B equals the union of these. Um, so the probability of B equals the probability of these, but we can break that into plus, 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 because they're all disjoint, 
Okay? Now we just use conditional probability. That is, we take this, and we can write it as the probability of B um, slash A1 times the probability of A1. And over here, it's going to be the probability of B slash AK times the probability of AK. Okay, this is just from the definition of conditional probability. In other words, what does this mean? B given A1 means what? means this divided by A1, probability of A1. So I just put the A1 here, okay? And then I can write that uh, with this. I can just put sigma here and say, just write AI here, AI, and just go from I equals 1 to K, okay? Uh, then, so we just had this one. Now, uh, probability of, uh, da, 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 where's this come from? So the, the definition of this is the probability of AI, I'm sorry, the probability of AI slash B is this, we already saw that. Now, take this and just do the simple switch. Just uh, switch AI intersect B to B intersect AI. Okay, and divide by the same thing here. Then I can rewrite this like this. Why? Because this is, by definition, equal to this. Okay? But now, what did I achieve again? AI given B, B given AI. Okay, that's what we wanted to achieve. Now we just replace the probability of B in the denominator with uh, this which comes from here. We just put that in the denominator, put this, use this, and I have the general version of Bayes' theorem. Okay, so it wasn't very hard. So Bayes' theorem, as we said, is stated this way. Okay, uh, let me give you some more uh, <laughs> Uh, vocabulary. Uh, P of A given B is sometimes called the posterior probability of A given B. As opposed to, what's the, what's the, what's the opposite of posterior? Anybody know? Yeah, well, yeah, there are probably other various words, but prior. I want prior. Okay, posterior means what? After. And prior means what? Before. Right? So, we're talking about this one versus this one. This P of A slash B versus P of A. So which one would be called the, pro, uh, the posterior? Right, this is the probability of A after being given B, so that's posterior. And this is before we're given any information, any, any prior information. So this is called the prior, okay? So P of A is sometimes called the prior probability of A, prior to knowing that B occurs or not. And the, for, I don't know where this comes from, but P of A slash, I'm sorry, P of B slash A here is called the likelihood function. And I can't really give you a good reason for that, but it's, I think it's just a historical reason. Uh, so it's called the likelihood function, uh, which we sometimes say is the probability of the evidence given the parameter. So by the evidence here, we mean um, uh, B and the uh, parameters are A. But anyway, that's in a different context, so it's not really relevant to what we're talking about. But anyway, I just wanted to give you these words, the posterior and the prior, and also if you feel like the likelihood function. So this one is called the what? Posterior, this one is called the? Prior, and this one is called the likelihood. Now, um, if we just uh, knock out the divider here, the denominator, we can say that this is proportional to this times this, right? And the proportionality factor, pa factor is the probability of B. So in other words, we can say this. The posterior probability can be written in the memorable form. I don't know how memorable it is, but uh, the posterior probability is uh, proportional to the likelihood times the prior. Okay, so you've seen those words now, okay? So sometime if you ever 
see them again, you can say, oh, I think I remember that from somewhere, even though I don't remember what it means. Okay, and you can go back and look it up in Wikipedia. Okay, here's an example. I think I might, well, let's just uh, read the beginning of it anyway. <clears throat> no, let's not. Let's go on. Okay, independent events, a review. That's the definition of uh, independence, right? The probability of A slash B is equal to the probability of A. An alternative view is that, right? Remember, what, what do I mean by comma? Intersect, so the probability of A intersect B is equal to the probability of A times the probability of B, right? So we can express independence like this or like this. Now, here's another concept called conditional independence. So, let's look at this picture. Let's suppose that this is the sample space, and we have three events here. The event that we get, the, so we're going to draw a square at random. We're going to select a square at random. And we're going to have three events. One is that this uh, square that we selected is red. Uh, sorry, what happened? Uh, not is red. All right, one is that we select a square in the red location. The red location is here, here, here. I think you can see where it is, up to here, right? That will be... Uh, uh, um, one set. Another set is the blue location, which is where? Here. Everyone know, know what I'm talking about? And another event is that we select a square where the yellow square, where the yellow box is. Okay? Everyone understand? Okay, now, um, let me ask you, are, is the probability of red independent of the probability of blue. So you have to do some counting to check it. So what is the calculation we have to do to check whether red is independent of blue? So let's do it this way. So red given blue, is that equal to the probability of blue? So um, first, of, uh, what's the probability of blue? So how many squares are there here? There's seven across and seven down. Okay, so what, how many squares are there? 49. What's the probability that I get one of those uh, in the blue section? How many are there? Seven, 14, plus four more is 18, right? Did I get that right? Yeah, seven, 14, here, 18, right? Okay, so what's the probability that I, I get uh, one of those? If they're all e equally likely, it's 18 out of 40. Let's write this down. 18 out of 49. Okay, so that's what? The probability of blue. Now we want to check, is the probability of blue given red equal to that? Okay, so how do we do that? So given red means what's our new sample space? Means given red means our new sample space is here. Right? So how many are there in our new sample space? There's 7, 14, 16. So the denominator is 16. And how many of those are blue? 6, right? So are these numbers equal? 6 over 16? No, I doubt they're equal, right? Right? So therefore what? They're not equal, therefore what? They're not independent, they're dependent, right? So is are the events of blue and red, are they dependent or independent? They're dependent, right? Okay, does everyone agree? Okay, but now we're talking about a new concept called conditional independence, not independence, right? That's just dependent, independence, right? 
and now we've just agreed that red and blue, those two events, are not independent, right? However, suppose I ask you, what about the probability of um, red, are, I'm sorry, are red and blue independent given yellow? Given yellow. So what does given yellow mean? It means that we're limited to where? Only the yellow ones, right? So that's our new sample space, right? Okay, so now, if that's our new sample space, we want to, from within that sample space, we want to do basically the same question we did before, which is what? Take a look at the probability of blue. Okay, what is the probability of blue in the yellow? Uh, one half. One half, right? Okay, hope this works. <laughs> and, uh, now, how about given red? So now we're only in the red. Yeah, now we're only in the red, but we're given yellow, so we're still within the yellow, right? And now what? The probability of blue is what? Also one half, right? Does everyone see it? Okay, so. Given yellow, are blue and red independent? Yes, we just found they were. Okay, so that's the concept of conditional independence. So whether you follow the, all the calculations or not, the idea is that when we're given yellow, it means we're now stuck in here, and then we do the same calculation. We say, what's the probability of blue given red within the yellow? compared to the probability, or is that equal to the probability of blue within the yellow, not given the red, right? And it turns out that we just, if you do it, if you just count them up, you get yes, that they are independent. So what did we find in the first set of calculations? That blue and red were not independent the first time, not when we said given yellow, but just the first time. We said blue and red are not independent, but now given yellow, they are. Okay? So, this is a, a fact, right? So, um, that is the concept of uh, conditional uh, independence. So, we saw that sometimes, without conditional, things are not um, independent, and then with the condition, they are independent. It could be the other way around as well. Could be that they were independent before and they aren't now in the second calculation. Okay? So for either picture, check to see whether R given B is equal to R. So forget about this picture, but we're just working with this one. I don't know why, but in Wikipedia they had both of these. But anyway, we're just looking at this one. So uh, we already found that um, this was not true, so they weren't independent. However, this is true. So how do we, what we were just talking about, about conditional independence, is written like this. So what is the ca calculation? Given y, calculate um, red intersect blue and c, is that equal, uh, here, here's the better way, sorry, let's look at this one. Um, we could do it this way also, but uh, I want to. Sh this is the way we just did it. So um, blue intersect uh, yellow. Given that, uh, what's the probability of red? Is that equal to just the probability of red given yellow? Okay. Okay, and then another way to express it is this way up here. This is equivalent, this is like uh, before, we had two ways of expressing independence, not conditional independence. What were the two ways? This way and this way, right? And now we have two ways of expressing conditional independence. Actually, they're reversed now. This one before was on the bottom and this one was on the top. But anyway, two ways, this way and this way. Okay? So, 
Um, that's called, what's this called again? What's this concept called? Conditional independence. Okay? This is what we're going to use for Bayes' theorem. No, I'm sorry, for naive Bayes. Okay, are we lost yet? Are we lost yet? Okay, what time is it? Let's see, it is 3.20. Okay, so before we do naive Bayes, we're going to do something called complete Bayes, which is a little bit more straightforward. But naive Bayes makes a simplifying assumption on the complete Bayes, which makes the calculations easier. Okay, so we're going to do na uh, something. We're going to study complete Bayes, and then we're going to make some kind of simplifying assumption, which makes the calculations easier, and that's going to be called naive Bayes. Okay? And by the way, the assumption that we're going to make is right here. This. We're going to assume that things are conditionally independent, even though we have no reason to believe they are. Okay? But that's going to make our calculations easier. And it turns out that it works. And what I mean by works is, for example, this uh, Bayes, naive Bayes algorithm is used to classify spam. When you get in, like, Google, um, you know, you, get, you check your mail, you get lots of spam, but we don't know it, right? Because we don't check our spam folder, right? But there's lots of spam in there. How does Google know which ones should be, should, they should put in spam? They use basically something like this, and even though they make this additional assumption about conditional independence, which is not justified by anything in particular, it, turn, it makes it much easier to do the calculations, otherwise they couldn't do the calculations, it would take too long. But uh, it turns out that they can predict properly which is spam and which isn't. So in that sense, it's working. Okay? Even though there's no justification, that's it, or it's not clear where, where the justification comes for, from for making this. Anyway, I'm going getting ahead of myself. So let's go on. So the complete Bayes algorithm is very intuitive. The whole subject of classification in data mining, so we haven't talked, we haven't used that word before, classification, but in data mining we, there are basically only three things that we ever do, and the most important one probably is classification. Class, the whole subject of classification in data mining can be summarized by saying we are trying to decide what class a particular instance should be assigned to. So what does that mean? Anybody know what that means? I don't think so. Anybody know what that means? Probably not, right? You don't know what I'm talking about, right? Okay, let's take an example. Suppose we're a company that sells chocolate, and a new customer X shows up at our doorstep or at our website. So which of our products should we try to sell him or her? Okay, so let's suppose that we sell chocolate. So let's suppose we have dark chocolate, milk chocolate, white chocolate, or maybe they don't like chocolate at all. Okay, so basically what we're trying to do is classify or know in advance this is the kind of, per this is the kind of person who likes dark chocolate. Okay, that's what I mean by classify, or no. I should classify him as liking milk chocolate, or no, I should classify him as liking white chocolate, or no, he did, I should classify. So, of course, how do I know what to classify somebody as? I have to have some information about them, you know, like maybe their gender, or their, how much sugar they eat during the week, or whatever, right? Lots of different variables or in information I could have about people, but if I have that kind of information, then I want to be able to use that to classify somebody as the type of person that likes dark chocolate, or the next person, no, they're the type of person that likes milk chocolate. Okay, so that's what I mean by classification. Okay, so we get a new person, a new instance, a new uh, piece of, a new, uh, what do we call it? Well, a new instance, and we try to classify them into one of different types, like is this person, 
is their favorite color yellow, red, blue, or green? Okay, the same kind of thing. So here, the instance is x, and the classes that are the list of different products. Okay, so the, the classes, what I mean by the classes are dark chocolate, milk chocolate, white chocolate, and none. We are classifying X as being the kind of person that likes dark chocolate instead of the other categories or something, or vice versa. Okay? Is this clear? Um, so the complete Bayes algorithm answers the question, which class should I assign to instance X? So it's a way of answering this question, a way of predicting whether someone's going to like dark chocolate or milk chocolate, or the other kinds, in a very simple and intuitive way as follows. So what do we do? We find all, so we're talking about instances or people or records, right? So we get another, so we're talking about a situation like this. We have some data about people. So first is like their gender. And the next is uh, their income. And the next is uh, the number of calories that they consume per week. And the next is what else? What else might tell us whether somebody likes dark chocolate or milk chocolate? I couldn't even think of anything. How would we ever know what, what, what kind of chocolate somebody's going to like? I don't know. I tried to think of something, like some variables that would, would have some effect on this. I couldn't even think of anything. Okay. What? Pets? Ah, uh, okay, okay, all right. Okay, pets. Anything else? All right, anyway, it's hard to think of, right? But there could be some different variables that might be useful in predicting whether somebody, okay, likes dark chocolate. And over here, we're going to have the final column is going to be um, the type of chocolate. So like here we have a person that's a female and their income is $50,000 and their calories per week is something, I don't know, what should I say, 20,000 calories and they, they, have, they don't have a pet, no pet, and blah, 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 and they like milk chocolate. Okay? And then we have another record. This is a male and his salary is 40 and blah, 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 and he likes dark chocolate. Okay? Right? So we build up, we have this database. Maybe we have 10,000 people here. This is person number one, person number two. We have 10,000 uh, people in our database. Okay? Okay, now here's how the um, complete Bayes algorithm would, uh, now we get a new person. So, so we have all of this data, and with all of this data, we know what each person prefers. Okay? Now we get a new person, call them X, okay? And we don't know which they prefer, but we do know all of this stuff about them. And we want to use the stuff that we know about them to predict which type they're going to like. Okay, so we know that this person is a male and their income is 60,000 and blah, 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 blah. And now the question is, how can we use our data to predict what kind of ch chocolate this male likes? So what do you suggest? Because probably you'll come up with the same idea. The simplest, kind of the simplest idea. Someone in the database who has the exact same. Ah, right. Exactly right. So if you have somebody in the database who has the exact same numbers, exact same re uh, values for all these input variables, then what? You'll classify him, this new person, as having the same preference as the person in your database, right? But suppose you have 20 people that have the exact same, then what do you do? Very similar, but what would you do? 
it's very natural what we could do. Yeah, right. So ten of them like dark chocolate, and eight of them like white chocolate, and four of them whatever, like you know, whatever. And the most most of them like dark chocolate, then what are we gonna say? We're gonna say the new person should be classified as dark chocolate, liking dark chocolate, right? So that's what it says. So what does it say? Find all the other records just like X, i.e. where the input values are the same as with X. Do you understand what I mean by the input values versus the class classification variable? So the class the, these are the input variables, and this is the classification variable. Okay? So find all the records just like X, i.e. where the input values are the same as with X. Determine what classes those all belong to. So some of them are going to be dark chocolate, some of them are going to be white, some of them are going to be milk, and some of them don't like chocolate. And then, which class is the most prevalent? There are likely to be several records that have the same input values as our instance x. Right? Does everyone agree with this? Assign that class, this one, the one that's most relevant, prevalent, sorry, uh, to the new record. Assign that class to x. Okay? Hopefully we have some input variables, like age, gender, do they like, these are some things that I came up with, I don't even know, I was trying to think of something. Do they like spicy foods? That's a yes-no variable, right? Age is not, is a numeric variable, right? Gender is a, a zero-one variable, binary variable, a yes-no variable, or something like that, right? Ice cream, do they like ice cream, yes or no? How many kilograms over or underweight are they? <laughs> are they dieting? Etc. Right? So we have a bunch of different input variables. And we might use these symbols for them. Okay? Age, gender, uh, spicy food, and so on. So we're trying to do something like this. That. So what does that mean? Well, first of all, you see this line here, so that means what? Conditional, right? Conditional probability. So given what? Given that their age is 20, their gender is this, their uh, ice, spicy food is yes, their ice cream is no, their, their weight is minus 2 above the normal weight, and uh, they're not dieting, and so on, right? Given all of these values, What's the probability that they like dark chocolate? Right? This would be a kind of calculation we want to do. What's the probability that they like milk chocolate? What's the probability that they like white chocolate? And how do we get these? Just like you said, by counting up. Right? Okay. How many times are there this person? How many times does this, sorry, how many times does this occur? No, sorry. When we get this, some of the people will be dark chocolate, some of the people will be milk chocolate, some of the people will be white chocolate. These are all people that have exactly the same input variables as our, our new person, right? But some of them will like dark, some will like milk, some will like white, and some will like none, right? So we want to figure out all of these, and then whichever one of them is highest probability, will be what? That's the one we will, that's what we'll say about our new person, they like dark chocolate, or they like milk chocolate, whatever turned out to be the highest probability. Okay, here's another data set, this is not chocolate anymore. Okay, this is a famous data set in data mining, it's uh, we see it everywhere, every, every course they always use this data set. It's a very small data set. The um, uh, number of records, the number of people, I guess we could say, or the, let's say the number of instances, we have the first instance here, the second instance here, there are actually 14 here, 14 rows, okay? 
And uh, what the um, dependent variable or the class variable, the thing we're trying to predict or classify, is whether people are playing golf or not. Okay? And we have the variables that we use to do that are what? This one, the outlook, which is, um, you can see what it, the kinds of things it takes, the kinds of values it can make are sunny, overcast, rain. Those are the only values it seems to take. Temperature, numbers. Humidity, numbers. Windy, is this true, false? And from that, we decide whether somebody's going to play golf, whether they play golf or not. And this is our past data. So based on the, uh, so when, when we had this condition, they didn't play. When we had this condition, they didn't play. When we had this condition, they did play. And so on. Every, everyone understand? Okay. Now usually, uh, this, well, we usually transfer, we usually use this form of the data set, like this. So notice before, these were numbers, but here, they're not numbers anymore. Okay, so sometimes we use this version of the data set. So instead of saying, 85 degrees, we classify it, we, we, just, we, we have categories. So temperature isn't numbers, it's either hot, mild, or cool. Okay, same thing with humidity, and so on. So the predictor variables are these one, two, three, four, which are not numbers, and this is a yes-no variable, play golf. Okay? And now I'm changing the notation. So uh, let xi represent the different predictors. So here, what are the predictors? Outlook, temperature, humidity, and windy, right? So those are the different xi. So this might be x1, this might be x2, this might be x3, this might be x4, okay? And let cj represent the different classes. So the different classes here, there's only two. Either they play or they don't play. Okay, so I'm changing the notation here. So Xi stands for the predictors, and Cj represents um, the different values of the class variable. So the class variable is what? Uh, let, me, let me start here. What's the name of this variable? Outlook, what's the name of this variable? Temp, what's the name of this variable? Humidity, what's the name of this variable? Windy, what's the name of this variable? Play golf. C I, uh, what did I say? C J doesn't stand for this variable, it stands for the values that this variable can take. So it stands for either no or yes. Okay? Sorry about that, but that's the way I'm doing it. Okay? Uh, for example, recall, okay, so Xi are the outlook, temperature, humidity, windy, and the Cj are play and not play. So what is this uh, saying here? The probability of a particular class, meaning what are the two possible um, values for the class? Playing or not playing, so let's just choose one of them. So the probability of playing, given what? A set of values for in the input, right? What x1 equals, what x2 equals, what... So does everyone understand this notation? Okay, so this is um, the question that we were just trying to answer. We're, what the, we're trying to build a model to do this. Given the inputs, we're trying to predict the output, right? To classify a record, we compute the probability of belonging to each of the classes. So given a, a particular set of inputs, what's the probability that they play, and what's the probability that they don't play? And if the probability that they play is higher than that they don't play, then we predict what? That they play. Right? So this makes sense, right? Note that the above means that um, Bayes classifiers work only with categorical predictors. What am I talking about? What are categorical predictors? What am I referring to? 
I mean not numbers, not numeric. Because why? If these are numbers, there's so too many possibilities, right? We're, we're never going to find two people that are exactly the same age, for example. Right? So if we have to find matching records, we're never going to be able to do it. Because no two people are exactly the same age. Right? Right? No people are exactly the same whatever... Oh, sorry, we weren't doing age. The temperature is never exactly the same. Right? So, we don't... We're, uh, in this count... The way that we decided that we're going to do it is we're going to count records. We, we won't have anything similar, ever. Right? Unless we use categorical inputs as opposed to numeric inputs. Okay? So, note that the above means that the Bayes, the Bayes classifiers work only with categorical predictors. Predictors means the inputs. If we use a set of numerical predictors, then it would be very unlikely that two instances, that is, or multiple records, would have the same value for those for all the predictors. Therefore, numer numerical predictors should be bin. What that means is, instead of saying, today it's uh, what the temperature might be what about eight, not 20, 10, 20 degrees right now. So today the temperature is. 20.4444444. No. We say the temperature is between 20 and 21. So that's a bin. The temperature is between 19 and 20. That's another bin. So then we just get categories, a finite list of categories, right? Basically. Okay? So therefore, numerical predictors should be bin. Okay, let's try an even simpler data set. What time do we only have eight minutes? Okay. Okay, so um, here we only have um, we only have a one predictor variable, and we're still trying to predict whether they play or not play, but we're only using one predictor variable. What is it? Human. Right? So we have here's our data set. Um, so what does this 50 mean? There were 50 days when it was humid and they didn't play. There were 50 days when it was not humid and they didn't play. There were 180 days that were humid and they did play. And there were 720 days when it was not humid. Okay? And the total number of humid days is this plus this, which is 230. The total number of not humid days is this plus this, which is 770. And the total number of days in our data set is 1,000. Okay? Now, in data mining, this is called the training set, and we'll talk about that more, but I, I use that word on this slide. Uh, so it's just the set that we build the model from. Okay? So uh, predict play versus not play, that's what we're trying to predict, based on just one predictor, human, not human. X is humidity and C is play or not play. So we're trying to predict C uh, given this input of humidity. So I said, suppose we actually have 1,500 records, but the above is the training set, so just ignore that. Okay. So applying the full or exact classifier, in other words, what, what I called earlier, complete base. Suppose uh, now that we have a new record to predict, as to whether they will play or not. And we only have this one variable, human. Human, not human. Okay? Uh, and we want to use our training data to make the prediction. Okay? Uh, if for the new record it's humid, then, okay, so let's go back to it. Suppose it's humid, then um, which should we predict? Given that it's humid, there were 50 days where they didn't play, and 180 that they did, so we should do what? We should predict that they're going to play, right? And what's, the predict what's our probability that they don't play? 50 out of 230, and what's the probability that they do play? 180 out of 230, right? So here, 50 out of 230 and 180 out of 230, right? Okay, next, 
So using the, uh, the rule assigned to the most probable class, we would say that they will play. Right, let's check that again. All right, we would say that they're going to play. Okay, so given that it's human, we predict that they play. Agreed? Okay. However, note that even if it's not humid, we're still going to uh, assign the class play, right? Because if you go back to here, even if it's not humid, you're still going to say play, right? So, kind of disappointing. But that's the, way it, that's the way it works, right? That's what our data would tell us to do. Basically, under any all conditions, we're just going to say they're going to play. Not very interesting, right? But anyway, that's what the data works out to. And that's uh, some, well, we'll come back and talk about it later. Okay, so because of that, we're going to sort of to try to um, avoid that kind of situation, we're going to talk about a, something called the cutoff probability method. So suppose we are more interested in identifying instances of not play and don't care so much about misidentifying records that are play. So in other words, um, we can make different kinds of errors here. Let's think about it. New person comes in and we predict that they are not a new person. A new, we get a new instance and we predict that it's gonna, that, uh, that the people are going to play golf. So what would be the error there if they actually didn't play golf, right? So we could have made an error, right? On the other hand, what's, another, what's the other error that we could get? We could predict that they, I forget, now I forget what I said, but we could predict that they aren't going to play and they actually do play. I don't know if I repeated myself or not there, but I think you know what I'm talking about. Okay, so suppose that we're more worried about one of those errors and not so worried about the other. So suppose that we're more worried about, let's, let's take another example, we'll have to stop here, but one more simple example. Suppose you have a, a, a test, a medical test for cancer, okay? And you're going to use this test just like we're going to try and predict whether people are going to play or not. You're going to try and predict whether people have cancer or not based on this test. It's a blood test, right? So we extract their blood and we do whatever medical people do. And they come up with, you know, because of a certain amount of something in the blood, they say, you know, we predict that this person has cancer or they don't have cancer, right? Or something like that. Okay, so we have this test for cancer. So uh, there are two kinds of errors we could make. So we could make this kind of box here. And we could say, this is what the uh, test predicts. The test predicts here. So this, the test predicts that they, they have cancer or no cancer. Okay? And then, but... Just because the test says you have cancer doesn't mean you have cancer, right? Tests are not perfect. So the reality is that you could have cancer or you could not have cancer, okay? So now the test, if the test predicts that you have cancer and you actually have cancer, then the test was correct. And if the test predicts that you don't have cancer and you actually don't have cancer, then the test was correct. So anything in, so suppose there were, 50 cases where the test predicted that there were cancer and you actually had it, and the people actually had it. So that would be 50 cases where the test was correct. And suppose there were 100 cases like this. So that would be 100 cases also where the test was correct, right? Okay? On the other hand, suppose there were 10 cases here. What's that mean? What does that mean? There were 10 cases where what? The test said they didn't have cancer, but they actually did. That's one kind of error. And another kind of error, suppose there were 15 cases here. How many numbers? Let's make it 20. 20 cases here, what's that? The test said they had cancer, but they actually didn't have it. Okay, so these two are correct, and these two are errors. 
Okay? Now, you know, which kind of error would you prefer not to make? So here's one error, error one, and here's error two. Which would you prefer not to make? Error one, why? Because error one says you don't have cancer, but you actually have it. That's a little bit more dangerous than error two, which says you do have cancer, but you don't, but you actually don't have it, right? So you might prefer to make, you might try to um, tweak your your system, your pro, your prediction system, so that you're more likely to make this kind of error and less likely to make this kind of error. Okay? And the same thing here, suppose we are more interested in identifying instances where people, uh, of people not playing, not play, and don't care so much about misidentifying records that are play. Okay? So how can we tweak our method? So we're going to use a cutoff, actually, to do that. And we'll talk about that next time, I guess. Okay, so that's all we have time for today. Uh, we'll have to finish uh, the Bayes, um, naive Bayes discussion next time. So uh, I guess I'll post this video somewhere in case you want to listen to it again. And I'll also give you this uh, PowerPoint. You can review it. And um, I'll mention uh, on our website uh, about any kind of homework and or quiz that we might have.